Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you're here. I love you guys. I, I love this place, and I'm just glad that we get to be here together. Um, you know, I um, I don't watch the news a whole lot, so I can I you know, unfortunately, I'm not always up to speed on certain things. But you would have to be blind and and just not paying attention at all to not be aware of the devastation on the other side of this world. And, um, you know, uh, often we try to begin something with maybe a little lighthearted statement, but I think we would do wrong on a day type. Today, when I open up my phone this morning to see something, and it tells me that as of about 9.30 this morning, uh, the death toll is up to about 33,000 over in Turkey and in Syria. And so as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning to begin our time of worship this morning, which is right and good and needed for us, we need the Lord for us to worship the Lord. You recognize that, church? We can't recognize the Lord without the Lord's help. We can't worship the Lord without the Lord's help. But I want us to just take a moment to pray for those families over there as well as we lift them up. Um, our Christian brothers and sisters, we do have Christian brothers and sisters across the world, and for the, the families and their loss, and for those who do not know Jesus, who still have breath in their lungs, that they might come to know Jesus through this um, devastating uh, event that has taken place. So join with me, church, if you would, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning facing the reality of death, 33,000 and counting, Lord, uh, people died almost in an instant, families torn apart, devastation beyond really what we can even fathom or imagine or try to understand outside of being in an event like that. I don't think we can. We look at the, the pictures, we think in our own minds of what that must be like, and we just can't. But, Father, we know that you are there, that you're never any closer than when there is suffering. And so, Lord, we, we thank you that you are the omnipresent God, that you are present in all places at all times, and that you do know everything, and that you are the God of all comforts. And, Lord, we ask you, Father, in a way that only you can in a way that doesn't make sense to us of how peace could come in a time like this, that you would bring peace and comfort to those people over there, to those moms and dads and daughters and sons and, and aunts and uncles and grandparents and friends and those who are deeply mourning the loss of the loved ones that they know are dead, much less the ones that they're not even, that they don't even know. They don't even know where people are. The fear the anxiety that comes with the unknown, Lord. Would you enter into that time, Lord? Enter into that, those families and into their hearts, Lord, and give them peace in this. Would you rally your people together to, to prayer across the world, to lift these people up to you? And would you bring resources, the necessary items needed to to, to, to help and to, and to do what all needs to take place over there and to build and to bring food and medical supplies and uh, medical workers and construction workers and engineers and things that we don't even know they're going to need, Lord, would you, would you do that? We think about when you built the temple, you clearly laid out everything that was needed. You are not ignorant or unaware of anything that needs to happen or take place there. And so we ask you, in your sovereign providential care to, to provide all that is needed. And Lord, as we think about 33,000, uh, Lord, I pray that you would um, not just fill us with a, a compassion and a desire to, to care for the physical needs. Help us to do that. Help us in this church, in this place, move in these people move in us to be a part of that and do that if we can. But I'm praying, Lord, we're praying that you would fill us with a burden for the spiritual need of those people. That we would be praying for the salvation of the lost. 
that we would be praying for the Christians over there who will be ministering to so many people in this time, that they would be able to, in the midst of caring and mourning and crying and thinking and talking about different things, that they would be able to to interject the gospel, that they would have the words to talk about Jesus to a people who need Jesus. Because the fact is, Lord, there is coming a day when not just 33,000 people will die, but everyone will stand. For you are coming back as the judge. May the reality of death bring a, an urgency to the spiritual condition in need to a lot of dying and lost people. Lord, as we gather here in this place, we want to thank you for your protection of our land, of our country that you have done and given to us for so many years. <clears throat> May we never take it or you for granted. I pray that you would continue to protect us and watch over us, Lord. Thank you that we can come and gather here today in the freedoms that we have, that we can worship you freely. I pray that you would be pleased with our worship time this morning, that we would worship you in truth and in spirit, Lord. Father, we pray over the preaching of your word today. We know that your word does not come back void, and so we, we sit and wait patiently and with excitement for what you have for us today. Teach us and remind us of what you have done for us in Jesus and in the hope that we have. Encourage us today. Encourage the, the child here today, your child who is struggling, who has doubt or is afraid. Would you remind them of who you are today. Open their eyes to, to see you once again, the way that we all saw you when you first came and, and you saved us. And we knew, we just knew that you were God and that you were love and you were perfect and all we desired and wanted was to be with you. Would you bring us back to that place this morning? Lord, we thank you for this time. We ask that you would be in this place today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us if you're able, and we'll worship our King together with crown him with many crowns.
thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above. church. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 2 uh, this morning. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 beginning in verse uh, number 1. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them though privately before those who seemed influential the gospel that I had proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running and had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not found to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. 
So then, uh, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. The word of the Lord this morning. Lord, I pray for your assistance this morning in um, helping us to see. We, as has already been prayed, we can't know you at all um, without your help. And so I pray uh, graciously, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to us today, that we would understand the most important things in all of life, that we would understand what it means to trust in you and trust in your sacrifice for us rather than trusting in ourselves. Lord, it's uh, a matter of the utmost urgency because we don't ever know when you're going to come. We don't ever know when earthquakes are going to happen or floods or lightning or anything, car accidents. We don't know when any of that is going to happen to us. And so I pray that we would sense the urgency in Paul's words to this church and to our church, Lord. I pray you would help us with such things. Bless us now, Lord, as we continue in our praise to you. May it be from our heart and not just our lips, we pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my
See, below. 
Lord, uh, there's, as we've already mentioned a couple of times, Lord, it's, though there's turmoil in the world, Lord, we still recognize you as king and that you're on the throne and we, we seek to give you the honor that you're due, Lord. But Lord, even the, the spiritual sacrifices that we bring from our, from our lips with praise could never amount to the worth that you're actually due the honor that you're actually due. We could never do enough to, to repay or to praise you enough, Lord, for what you've done uh, in the gospel for us, in the shed blood of Jesus on the cross for us, Lord, that, that you would pay for our sin, not in part, but the whole. All of it is nailed to the cross, and we, br- we bear it no more, Lord. So we praise you, Lord, with our soul, with all that we are. Lord, may you get all the glory and all the honor and everything said and done today. Speak to us now by your spirit through the preaching of your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. church. Uh, As I noted in the bulletin this morning, it has not escaped my notice that the earthquake that has taken so many, and um, I'm sure the death count will go up, destroyed a very large geographical region in the world, occurred in the area formerly known as Galatia. Uh, That's providential, I guess, to uh, our studies in this book. When Paul planted churches in this region, he did so because he was concerned for their souls, and we ought to still be concerned for their souls, right? One of the benefits of our church belonging with the Southern Baptist Convention is that they provide a vehicle for relief called Send Relief, as you just heard and saw, for us to directly engage uh, with relief efforts on the ground in Turkey in the name of Christ. I'm going to ask our elders uh, to send an offering to Send Relief Uh, to help those efforts. If you would like to participate in that offering personally, uh, you can give online and just mark that or write a check, put it in the memo line, or just tell uh, Samantha uh, when you see her. Um, Now, before we jump into into our text this morning, I want to give you some passages that I hope will set the stage for us well. It's been just a few years since Paul had founded these churches, But much to Paul's astonishment, they had already begun to doubt uh, the gospel as he had preached it to them. The seed of doubt about Paul and his gospel had been planted by a group of apparent believers that we now call Judaizers. These Judaizers so associated God uh, with being Jewish that they believed that one actually had to become Jewish in order to be accepted by God. And the way in their mind that one became Jewish was to be circumcised. We read Acts 15 last week, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's pretty unequivocal. From this letter that we're reading, Galatians chapter 6, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. Now, where had they gotten such an idea? Well, they didn't make it up out of thin air. They saw that it had come from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant. Even prior to the law, the very 
identifier of being a Jew came from Genesis chapter 17, where God had commanded Abraham to circumcise his children as a sign of the covenant between the Jewish people and God. But now Jesus had come. And with the coming of Jesus, there comes a new covenant. Jesus said at the Last Supper, Luke 22, this cup is poured out for you. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant, is the new covenant. That implies there was an old covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. This new covenant, this new testament had been predicted by the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming. Notice the tense, it's not yet here. It's yet future from when he's writing. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The writer of Hebrews tells us that that new covenant was in fact a better covenant. Hebrews 7 This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. He guarantees the better covenant. Okay, now that's a lot of rapid-fire scripture, but I just wanted to go through that to make sure you got the idea that Paul's gospel, Paul's message, was this new covenant that Jesus spoke about. Paul's gospel was the better covenant. The Old Testament prophet had predicted and the writer of Hebrews tells us about, even though the Judaizers were trying to discredit Paul's message and Paul, Paul was not backing down from it. In Paul's absence in the Galatian churches, the Judaizers had come in and were saying that Paul was not one of the original 12 apostles. He just heard what they were saying, and you shouldn't really listen to Paul Paul had changed the, uh, the uh, apostolic message, and he didn't have any authority to do such a thing. In fact, he doesn't really have any authority at all. He's like the security guard down at the outlet mall. Not, no, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we've talked about authority before, but the first and second chapters of Galatians, almost a third of the book, is about authority. Who says that's the gospel? Who says that's what God says? Because if you don't have any authority, it doesn't really matter what you say. We can decide for ourselves what we think God says. Unless someone has authority over me to tell me otherwise, I can decide for myself. And authority is exactly what Paul is asserting He's maintained this from the very beginning of the letter. I I mean the very beginning. Verse 1 of Galatians 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Verse 12, I did not receive this gospel message from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And Paul spends the rest of chapter 1 arguing that he didn't just hear something from the other apostles, that his apostleship came independently from the Jerusalem apostles, and that he stands on equal footing with the other apostles. But now, what, what I want us to try to do is to put ourselves in the shoes of the Galatian church who's hearing all this, reading all this. Paul has, up to this point in the letter, made his case about his apostleship and has reestablished his credibility with them in their minds as they read this letter. But the question no doubt must have arisen, is there a contradiction then among the apostles themselves? Do we have men of equal authority preaching two different gospels? The Judaizers had come in and they were claiming to represent the apostles in Jerusalem but their message didn't square with what Paul was saying. So even when the authority of Paul is settled, another serious question looms, is there disunity among the apostles? If one apostle preaches one gospel and another preaches another one, we're in trouble. So now Paul deals with this question in our text this morning, but he must do it very carefully. On the one hand, he must maintain his independence from the Jerusalem apostles. 
to protect himself from being labeled as just a follower of them. And on the other hand, he has to show that the gospel he preaches and the gospel the Jerusalem apostles were preaching were the same gospel. And again, why are we concerned about this in 2023? Why at least should we be concerned about this in 2023? Because you have to decide what to believe. We have to decide what to believe, who to believe. So we'll break these verses down a bit, but the summary of what Paul's going to say to the Galatian churches is this. Yes, I finally did confer with the apostles. They didn't really add anything other than what I was already teaching. Uh, in fact, they approved of what I was teaching, meaning that there aren't two Gospels, there's only one. So the Judaizers really don't represent the Jerusalem apostles. On the contrary, and now he drops a bombshell, they're not even really believers. They weren't sent here by the apostles. In fact, they're spies, he says. They're here to take away your freedom and make you slaves again, so don't fall for it. That's the long and short of the passage. We could dismiss and go home. We're not going to do that. Now, we talked about the Jerusalem troop, uh, trip that Paul mentions in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2, but let's remember what we said very quickly. Paul did not go to Jerusalem because he had had second thoughts about his gospel. He was quite confident. He wanted to make... Uh, sure that everyone knew how confident he was. If he was not confident going down there, it would have played right into the hands of the Judaizers. So he knows, it says in verse 2, that he went there by revelation. God had told Paul to go there. That much we read last week. But now in verse 3, we read more about why Paul took Titus with him. He's mentioned Titus once. Paul takes Titus because Titus, Titus is exhibit A for Paul's gospel. Specimen number one for Paul's gospel. Titus is a Greek. He's not been circumcised according to Old Testament law. So there. It's kind of what he's saying. Paul's forcing the issue. Titus is a brother in Christ, Paul says. So the question is, will he be forced to be circumcised by the apostles in Jerusalem or won't he be? Paul says, let's just take you up there, Titus, and see. I wondered if Titus was a willing participant. <laughs> Listen, Titus, uh, let's you and I go to Jerusalem and see if they make you get circumcised. What do you say? Uh, well, uh, 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 right? <laughs> Listen, there's no better way of forcing the issue than to take along a real person. And Titus is thankful, I'm sure, that verse 3 happened, Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised. I can hear him going, whew, or whatever the whew is in the Greek. <laughs> now, if the apostles in Jerusalem had disagreed with Paul and insisted on circumcision for Titus, for Gentile believers, that would mean the apostles of Christ had contradictory messages. Paul was sure of what the gospel was. He didn't need to confirm his own gospel. He went to Jerusalem because he needed to confirm that the other apostles agreed with him. That there was unity, in fact. That would be important to show these young church plants. Now, let's think about this. The fact that God sent Paul to Jerusalem tells us one thing at least, that God wants us to confront disagreement head on. If we're going to be a biblical people, a biblical church, we must be a confronting people. I know that's not what our 21st century Western culture says. No, no, don't confront. Let's just be quiet about that. Don't push that issue. Better that we just let sleeping dogs lie. But I think this pattern shows us that if we think something is wrong or if we think the ministry of the church might be in jeopardy, we must seek God for the grace to go to the person or group of people in grace and state our position. Almost none of us do that naturally. It creates tense feelings. 
and we would just as soon avoid confrontation if we can help it. For most people, there are people out there, aren't there, that seem to look for it. But generally, I don't think that's true. Plus, I mean, after all, we're not apostles. We don't have that kind of authority to go around confronting stuff anyway, which is true, except that we have the apostles' word, which is God's word. So um, let it never be said that this or that is what the church at Heathrow teaches. Rather, let it be said that the church at Heathrow teaches what the scriptures teach. That's what we want. You see, the desire for personal comfort um, and fear of conflict from confronting one another in love doesn't come from Christ. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. These are products of the flesh. We have, listen, we have a ton of idols in this country, a ton of it. We are an idolatrous country, an idolatrous culture. But let me tell you what I think the biggest one is for most Americans, including in our number. It's comfort. We are enslaved by a love of our comfort. We put our comfort above just about everything else. Pastor, I'll serve the Lord if it doesn't make me too uncomfortable. Yeah, I'll give to the earthquake thing, Pastor. I'll give every month if it doesn't cut into my financial comfort. And Pastor, yeah, we probably should say something about that. Unless, of course, it creates conflict, then we better just be a church that goes along to get along. Maybe, Pastor, it would be better if you just didn't say anything about that whole sex and gender roles thing. Let's just, let's not, don't push. But when we are absolutely 100% certain and sure about what the gospel is, it brings with it a freedom to do what Paul did without fear, which is to confront disagreement head on. In fact, spoiler alert for next week, Paul's even going to confront Peter. That's pretty gutsy. You do remember Peter, the head of the apostles. That's the guy Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Paul's going to confront Peter. Why would Paul do that? Because Paul understood that whatever peace that we get in our personal relationships or in our church would only be superficial and short-lived and would end up making us weak in the long run because it would mean that we're we're walking by the flesh and not by the Spirit if we don't confront wrong thinking. We must confront where the Scriptures confront. All of it. And all of it has to be in love, that to be sure. But we must confront. And this teaches us, too, about the importance of doctrinal unity, especially on points that are crucial, especially as it concerns the gospel. It ought to bother us. It ought to bother us that there's so much division in the church over matters of important doctrine. And it should make us want to study the Scriptures even more to make sure that we understand them well. We must be careful that we don't fall into the thinking that disunity is harmless or, or even worse, which I saw just this past week, a, a very well-known pastor, basically saying the idea of disunity is valuable, he says. You know, the N-word right now is diversity. I'm not talking about racial or cultural diversity. That we want. I'm talking about doctrinal diversity. Doctrinal diversity is just a euphemism for contradiction. Very few people today stand up and praise the unity of truth. Being equivocal on things, we're told, is, being, is equated with humility. Don't, don't be so dogmatic. Why are you so dogmatic? Believe what you want, but you don't have to... You need to be open a little more to other people's thoughts and feelings, and it becomes unimaginable that there might be any doctrine in the world that we would be willing to actually die for. Doesn't such an idea seem completely foreign to us in our day and age within the church? But boy, the reformers sure were willing to die for their doctrines, and they did. Protestant theology, Baptist theology, um, people were tortured and burned at the stake for such ideas. 
It seems so out of place in our day and age. Paul's example here teaches us that it matters a lot what Christians agree on when it comes to crucial doctrines of our faith. If we're not willing to confront people over them, we're certainly not willing to die over them. Now, in verse 4 of chapter 2, Paul drops the aforementioned bombshell. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, the bombshell is that these Judaizers aren't believers who had just been confused about the gospel. No, it's more than that. It's worse than that. They're not even really believers. In fact, they're spies. Now, I don't know about you, but I love a good spy story. I think I was about a junior in high school. I can't exactly remember, but I read a book from a brand new author, his first novel, a guy named Tom Clancy. Anybody remember Tom Clancy? It was called The Hunt for Red October. You may have seen the film, which was much worse than the book. The book was great, totally different ending. Shout out. That was my first spy novel, but it wasn't my last. I think I read every one of Tom Clancy's books after it and many others. I love a good spy story. I love the intrigue. But I, I don't think you have to read a good spy novel to know that to be a good spy, people can't know you're a spy. Good spies are plumbers and football coaches and piano teachers, people you'd never expect. Spies don't walk around in CIA t-shirts, right? If someone's got a CIA t-shirt on, you can bet they're not a spy. If someone tells you they work for the CIA, and they do, it's probably because they're a janitor or a parking lot attendant at the building, but they ain't spies, right? It was false brothers in the church, but the rest of the church didn't know they were false brothers, they seem like believers. Their questions were sincere. Their beliefs seemed sincere. But they were there to take away the freedom that the gospel brings. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time in the weeks to come exploring just what that freedom means. Suffice it to say right now that if the church would have listened to them, Paul says, they would have been brought into slavery. So verse 5, we did not yield submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. What seems apparent is that this lack of freedom of these false brothers, the gospel that they were preaching, the freedom that the Judaizers denied, does not represent the view of Peter, James, and John, does not represent the gospel of the doctrine of the apostles in Jerusalem, and it's not the truth of the gospel. If Paul had given in to the demand of these false brothers, the gospel would have been destroyed. There, there would be no good news if Paul gave in to the demand for circumcision. The good news to the world is that, and I want everybody to listen carefully, right standing before God was totally paid for by the death of Christ on the cross and can only be had through faith in His sacrifice. If you are relying at all, one ounce, on your good works, or something you did when you were 12, or something you're not doing now, the gospel's destroyed. Any requirement that causes us to rely on our work and not Christ's work is the end of the gospel. If you think that you're saved because of what Jesus did on the cross and something and anything, something you've done with Christ's work on the cross, Paul's gospel message, the apostles' gospel message is destroyed. There's no and. And Paul calls them out on it. He labels them as false. They may have come from Jerusalem, but they do not represent the Jerusalem apostles. They're false brothers, and their demands that you be circumcised and keep the feast or whatever else they're all saying is a different gospel, which he says in chapter 1 and verse 7, there's no gospel at all. There's no good news at all. So finally now, Paul is so sure of his gospel that he describes his encounter with the apostles in verse 6 by saying, from those who seem to be influential, 
What they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Now, he's not throwing Peter, James, and John under the bus. He calls them pillars in a second. But he's just saying, as far as God's concerned and the gospel is concerned, they're just humans like everybody else. I got my gospel from God. They did too. But God shows no partiality among that. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me, Paul says. Isn't that a statement to make? Peter, James, and John didn't add anything to what I already knew. Wow. <laughs> wow. How could he say that? Because he and Jesus had been with each other. He's like the only one on the planet that could ever say such a thing. Years after his conversion and call to ministry, Paul finally spreads his gospel before the Jerusalem apostles, but they did not feel like they needed to add anything to it. I'm sure they questioned him, and he gave their answer. They went, yeah, 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 right, right. Even more importantly, the end of verse 9 says, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. There it is, the unity Paul was after. He, he had not run in vain. The Judaizers did not represent the Jerusalem apostles. The apostolic witness was not split. The gospel had been preserved for us. How do we know that, church? How do we know that Paul's message and the apostles' message really is true, that we can put our faith in what he said, that we can put our trust in what he said? How do we know that we don't have to be baptized to be saved? How do we know that we don't have to keep the holy sacraments in order to be saved or speak in tongues to be saved or have our good works outweigh our bad works to be saved? How do we know that? Well, once again, it goes back to authority. Paul's spending two chapters on his authority. Yesterday, um, yesterday, I once again had the wonderful experience of walking through TSA security at the airport. Uh, it, coming out of Detroit yesterday, it was cold in Detroit yesterday, 18 degrees when I woke up yesterday morning and walked out of my hotel um, I walked outside and my shadow froze to the sidewalk. It was cold. <laughs> All that to say, when you're standing in line at security at the airport, coming outside of the cold, it takes longer because everybody's got jackets and scarves and hats and gloves. All the things you have to take off before you go through the machines there. And the lines were long and people were getting impatient. I could hear them. You know, you can hear that murmur of discontent. Are we going to make our flight? We're not, we don't seem to be moving at all. Everybody's looking, trying to crane to see what the holdup is. And over to my right, a good bit away in the crowd, I hear somebody above the din of the noise raise their voice and yell. And I couldn't make out what they were saying, except it was a lot of filth, foul, filth and foul, and your filth, something about cow fertilizer over and over and over again. And the TSA agent started yelling right back at the guy. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, I'm, th there's going to be trouble. The cops are going to come. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to make my, you know. But you know what happened? There wasn't any trouble. Nobody tried to break through the line, rush the guards. Nobody tried to take their stuff through without putting it on the little metal belt thingy thing that goes through the thing. People took off their shoes. They took off their belts, all their cold weather stuff. Even though everybody seemed in a hurry and impatient, everybody got through. We, we all sat there and we waited and we got through. And do you know why we got through? The answer is authority. We had to wait. We had to wait. Nobody's getting through to catch their airplane unless the authorities say that you can come through. Now, the analogy falls way short, so bear with me. Nobody's getting through the gates of heaven unless the authority says so. And there's only one authority, and it's Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what he said. I'm the way. There's no other authority. Imagine if I had tried to get through airport security yesterday with no ID of any kind. I, don't, I didn't have any ID of any kind. And I walk up and say, I don't, I don't have any ID. Of it. 
and I'm not going through that metal detector thing. I don't want to go through it. I'm going to take my K-bar knife here that I got in Marine Corps, and I'm going to walk right through, and nobody's going to stop me. I'm just going to walk right through. And they came to me and tried to stop me, and I said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. I'm allowed to go through because Billy Bob, the security guard down there at the outlet mall, said I could go through. Am I getting through? Why? Because he's got no authority. Now, imagine standing before Jesus with some other gospel other than what the apostles taught. Well, I just thought this gospel over here sounded better to me. I, I, don't, I don't think we should be excluding other people based upon their faith and what they believe. I, it seems too exclusionary, too narrow. I think we ought to be people that are a little more accepting of people. Listen, people reject Jesus and his gospel all the time, rejecting him right now on their deathbeds. Someone's telling them about Jesus, and they're rejecting it on their deathbeds. We reject it all the time. But be sure of this. The Acts of the Apostles, you've heard of the book of Acts? This is short for the Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Do you understand that it's Paul's way or the highway? This is it. Nobody comes except through Jesus. There's no other name besides Jesus. There's no other gospel besides Jesus' gospel, which the apostles preached. That's the only gospel. There's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Are we clear on that? We better be clear on that. We better be clear on that. Because you're not getting through. Nobody's getting through unless they go through the authority. Amen? Lord, I pray that you'd take these words and that you would do something with them. They're feeble words, and they're, not, they're, they're certainly not your word. And so all we have is to rely on your word, Lord. And so I pray that we would read and study your word well, that we would understand why Paul is doing what he's doing to establish himself as the authority that speaks for you. And he has told us and will tell us that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There is no other name under heaven given among men by where we can be saved other than Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You said that, Lord. And so now we pray to you. Isn't it an amazing thought, church, that we can pray to the Lord who said those words and that he can hear us? And so, Lord, we pray to you that you would give people the faith to believe this, that they wouldn't leave the building today without asking you to save them because that's the only way they can be saved is if we ask you, you you're the one who died for us. You're the one who completed the sacrifice, the only worthy sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Oh, may we, may we understand that. The sin debt has been paid. It has been nailed to the cross as we've sung this morning. We bear it no more, all and only because of what you did. So may we put our faith in that alone. Don't help us, Lord, not to put our faith in a decision that we make or something that we did or will do. No, it's none of that. It's all what you've done. We just believe. We just believe in what you've done. Lord, work that work of faith in us. Work that work of repentance in us. You have to do those things. You have to work through us. And so I pray that you would do that even now. If anyone within the sound of my voice does not know you, that you would give them the faith to believe and that they would believe, that they would make the choice to believe, Lord, by your grace, only by your grace. And for those of us whom you've already saved, Lord, may we double down on this. May we put all our eggs into this basket it is this gospel and no other gospel. It's you and you alone. So may we preach it well. 
May we impact people around us in the workplace, in our schools, in our social circles, everywhere we go, in our families, Lord. May we impact them all with this very deep, wonderful truth that you loved us and gave yourself for our sins. May we love you better this week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing. be our heart's confession that you and you alone, Lord, hold our life, our soul's fate, um, all our hope in your hands, Lord, that we find ourselves wrapped in Christ. Lord, we may not trust in anything else, not in our possessions, not in our comfort, not in our, good, our supposed good works but only, Lord, in you. It's in you that we find our refuge. It's in you that we find our strength and our hope. When all the world around us crumbles, Lord, may we look to you this week. Give us help. Give us boldness by your spirit to tell others about the gospel this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. <laughs>